Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another demonstration today. Today I'll be demonstrating the much requested shirt dress pattern. Of course, shirt dresses are incredibly common from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the 20th century. In vintage, shirt dresses are extremely common, so it's no wonder so many of you are wondering how to go ahead and modify the bodice pattern to make one. So today I'll be adding the front button placket closure onto the bodice pattern, as well as the fold back like a kind of standard collar. So let's go ahead and jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. All right, here I have the pattern I drafted earlier this week. I'll put a card up to that, showing how to make the all-in-one bodice front from the regular bodice, uh, two dart bodice block like this one. You could do this sort of modification to make a shirt dress out of any sort of bodice pattern. I'm just going to be using this all-in-one one today, just because I already had that tracing from making that other pattern earlier this week. So we will work with this. Um, of course, this has a center back closure right now. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just go ahead and fold the pattern along that line of the center back because I won't need seam allowance down the center back anymore. I'm going to cut this back on the fold because of course this will close down the front with buttons here. All right, so along the front here, I'm going to need to add uh, some sort of a placket or facing or fold over or something to facilitate the fold back collar and the like button, the area for button closure. So I'm gonna tape on some more paper here. You can again, uh, make this a separate piece that you sew on, but today I'm going to make this one that just folds back here along this edge. So I want to know how much more of an extension do I need for my buttons here? And that depends on what size of button you are using. So I'm going to be using a larger button today. So I'm going to go ahead and put a three full, um, three fourths of an inch overhang over this. I start with a half inch here. Then I decide to add a little bit more, especially because I was like, what buttons do I want to use? What do I have in stock here that I can use for this mock-up? Um, of course, I will probably end up cutting these buttons off of this mock-up that I'm going to make today to reuse them for something else, just because I'll be making this shirt dress uh, mock-up out of muslin for you today to show you what this looks like on. Um, but I'm going to go with these faux horn buttons here, so I just want to make sure I have a little bit of room for those. And so I'm going to add a little bit more on here. So just uh, depending on what size your button is, how many buttons you want to use, if you want to make this double-breasted or single-breasted, that depends on how much of an overhang you're going to need here past the center front. So this is three quarters of an inch past the center front now. And then of course I'm going to need fold back in the other direction. And one way to figure this out is to just go ahead and again, fold along that like finished line. Um, so I have this three quarters of an inch past the center front. I'm gonna go ahead and fold that along here. And then I will cut along uh, the neckline up here to get the perfect sort of facing shape that I will need, depending on how much I want to face this. Uh, of course you could fully line something like this too. Um, but uh, I'm just going to see about that fold back. All right, here we go. And I'm going to want at least maybe two inches of facing here. I usually, on my like neckline facings, you'll see me use two and a half inches all the time. So I'm putting two and a half inches down the center front of this. In this area, you can go ahead and interface so that um, this is all, has a little bit more structure up here near the buttons. You won't see me that do that today on the mock-up, but that's right. You want this to be wide enough that when you fold the collar back, you won't see. You can, of course, make this a full sort of neckline facing up here and have it meet up with the back facing. So that's one way to do this. So you can have this turn into a facing, it's nice to kind of smooth that off in between, like so, and then you won't have to worry about the fold back much of all, um, because of course, when you fold the collar back, you want it to be fully faced. Um, hopefully you'll see what I mean when I'm modeling this later. Um, here at the waist, of course, I don't need any of this extra, so I can go ahead and cut that off, and I will cut off the rest of this now that we have our fold back facing drawn on. All right, so now we have this and it will fold back and face that opening edge here in the front of this bodice pattern. However, this is you know gonna be kind of wide. So again, you could separate this along here, but you are gonna wanna add seam allowance if you do that, because right now it's relying on that fold. So you'll need to add a half inch to both the facing piece and the bodice piece if you do cut this apart. Um, but again, this is kind of wide. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and not face the whole neckline up here. You'll see how the collar finishes this inside. So I'm just going to actually give myself a little bit of room off this facing, just again, to make sure that my collar fold back has enough space. And I'm gonna cut that off. Um, I don't really need that facing. Um, you have so many options when it comes to shirt dress patterns and also shirt patterns of how you want to finish the collar, how you want to do the facing, how you want to do the fold back, how you want to do the placket separate folded like this. Um, there's really a lot of options. So this is just one way to do this, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, draft the fold back collar now. And to do so, we're going to need the measurements of both the front and back neckline here. Um, now this, weirdly enough, you are including the seam allowance at the side seam. So this in the front, I'm going from here at the sh like edge of the shoulder, even though there's side seam in here, I'm going from here to the exact center front. So I'm not including that front fold over. And in the back, again, I'm including the shoulder side seam and back to the center back. Um, I've tried to do this without 
because it seems odd to me to include that seam allowance for the shoulder. And I was like, I don't need that one inch, but you do. <laughs> so I don't know what magic is happening here, but you do need that shoulder seam allowance as part of this. So we're going to go ahead and square off a line here to draft our fold back collar. So we're just squaring off a little T to work with here. This is going to end up being our center back of our collar. So I'll go ahead and label that on fold as such, because that's how we will cut this later. So now we're going to measure forward on our line here, the three inches, which is our back neckline length here and then the four and a quarter from there, which is the front neckline length. Again, that center of like mark there, well, not perfectly center, but you know what I mean, is the shoulder line and yeah, just trust me, it works. <laughs> and then we're gonna measure, we're gonna tee up from the uh, four and a half there and then come up one half inch at the front of the collar here. This is just the standard that the book recommends. Um, sometimes I get questions about why I do something and it, it's usually because th that's just how I learned. It's how the book or an instructor told me. Um, I'm not making it up. It's, it comes from some sort of a reference. All right, and then we're gonna square up three inches for like the width of the collar. That's pretty standard here. Um, of course, you can change this later. And we're gonna come out an inch and a quarter on that along that line and then down to the half inch mark here. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing since I'm doing a terrible job explaining. But I'm gonna use a French curve to just draw in the curve from that half inch mark down to the straight of the neckline kind of edge here. Um, you don't have to use a French curve. You could draw that curve in yourself, but I of course have one, so I might, might as well. And then I'm going to add a seam allowance Again, along that curve down here, along the neckline edge, along the top of the collar, and then along the point of the collar as well. But of course, not along the center back because again, it will be cut on the fold. So I don't need seam allowance down there. And I, again, one of those things where it's like blink and you miss it. We've drafted the basic, most like standard collar. You can go ahead and change the shape of this quite a lot. Um, you can make this, of course, thinner or thicker if you want. You can make the point pointier. You can make it dip down lower if you want. You can curve this off to have like more of a like Peter Pan color, I think it's called, where it's like curved. Instead, you can make it um, like spiderwebby, gothically shaped. You can make it scalloped all the way along the top of the collar. You can do whatever shape you want. This is just going to be the most kind of standardized shape, three inch wide collar that I'll be using today. Um, again, you will need to like sew this onto the rest of your dress if you're making a shirt dress here. Um, this is just how to do the bodice. Uh, if you could use a gathered skirt, you could use a pleated skirt, circle skirt, pencil skirt, whatever you want, as long as you end up making it have a center front opening like this one. You could just also sew it to a regular skirt and keep the center back opening on the bodice and skirt too. Um, you'll see a lot of dress or vintage dress patterns where the top is a shirt waist, but it just gets sewn onto like a more normal skirt and there still is a center back or side opening for the whole shebang. But here I'm cutting this out of muslin and I'm cutting it out uh, you know, two of the fronts, a left and a right, and then one in the back on a fold. And then for the collar, I've cut out two of those along a fold. So you'll see that. I've just kept all my normal darts here. So I'm going to be sewing those. So let me just transfer those darts onto the muslin for the back here. Again, I am trying taller back darts with this just because uh, while working with these block videos recently, I've noticed maybe I should have taller back darts on my pattern. So we'll give it a shot today here in this muslin. Again, I'm just transferring my darts over onto uh, from the pattern from the paper pattern onto the muslin and then just marking those in colored pencil as I want to do. I usually use three or four pins to pin a dart and I will go ahead and just pinch and pin these and set this next to my machine. Of course, for something like this, if you were actually making a dress instead of a mock-up, you would want to go ahead and think about how you wanted to finish the raw edges and seams inside. I won't be serging this today like I normally would just because again, it is merely a mock-up to show you all what this looks like when sewn together. All right, so I'm going to sh um, mark where this fold over is just so I can iron it in a moment here. And then again, we'll mark my dart here on the center front as well. You can, of course, move this dart anywhere you want. Like I was saying last time, we're gonna have a whole video all about darts and dart manip manipulation coming up in a few weeks here on the channel. So um, hopefully clarity surrounding darts is coming shortly. <laughs> For those of you who are still like, what, why darts? Um, but I'll go ahead and mark my darts here on the fronts as well. And I will draw the line for the fold over just because this is a muslin and I can draw on it as much as I want. Of course, on your like final project, you would want to use like Taylor's chalk or something um, or pin that line instead, something removable or washable as opposed to this waxy color pencil that will be here forever, but that's all right. All right, just pinning those darts, pinching and pinning them and setting it near the machine. Just gonna go through the steps of how you would sew something like this today, just so you have an idea. And then we have our collar. So I have two pieces here again, like so, and I'm going to go ahead and sew them together. Um, you can interface one or both of these as well, depending on what, how thick your fabric is. This muslin is actually relatively stiff, so I'm not gonna even bother interfacing this for this demo today. 
just because this muslin will hold its shape quite well, just the two layers of this. Um, but you're going to sew around the edges of this and leave this last half inch along the neckline edge open, and you'll see why later. So but the rest of this you can sew and then clip the corners and turn it right side out and stuff. So I will show you that. I am going to use black thread on this cream colored muslin today so you can see what I'm doing, hopefully. And so I'm going to start with the collar. Again, I'm just going to sew half inch seam allowance like we added when we were doing the paper pattern a moment ago around the edge here. So leave the needle down, turn the project. That's how I would get around corners, even these more peaked kind of acute corners here and removing my pins as I go, being a good girl today. <clears throat> you know, it's because I'm using the thicker pins. I always sew over my thin pins. We may get to that later. You never know. But again, leaving this last half inch open here and you will see why when it comes to sewing the collar on. And set that aside for now and then go ahead and sew my darts in the fronts and backs piece, front, front and back pieces here. So again, just starting at the large end of the dart, sewing along my marking and then curling a tiny bit off the edge here. And then I just tie my darts closed like so, just tying a couple knots in the thread. Don't pull too, too hard, just like right down to the edge gently um, and then tie that off with a couple of knots. And you can cut the thread to about maybe an inch long and just leave them free inside the garment. This is what I was taught to do in fashion school at least. I mean, they gave us several options, but it seemed that this was the recommended choice. And I've run out of bobbin thread. Dang it, we're just gonna switch to a red bobbin. So for the rest of this, the thread will be black and red for the bobbin thread, which again is not so bad for a mock-up. Doesn't matter. But once all my darts are sewn, I can bring everything over to the ironing table and start pressing some darts where I need them to be. Again, I'm just going to press my darts here on the center back towards the center back. It's just how I was taught to press my darts towards the center. Some people have told me that they were taught to press them towards the side. I feel like as long as it's consistent is most importantly, it's the most important thing here actually, it seems. Just press my darts on the front towards the center front as well, and then I will go ahead and fold back that edge along the fold line that we had indicated and planned for while we were pattern drafting. So this edge, of course, in here needs to be finished in some way if you're making a real garment. So have it be surged, have it have seam binding, have it be zigzagged or pinked at least. Um, that edge along there will be free inside. So it will receive some friction. So it's good to have that seam finished in some way. You can, of course, turn it twice too, or hem it in some other way. Even just having it uh, turned once and then maybe tacked down would even be better than nothing. Let's give this all a quick press here, and then we can go ahead and press the collar. So I'm going to clip my curves like so, close to the edge, but not too close. Um, so I can go in there and poke that with a knitting needle here into submission. Just turn this right side out and just around my corners until they behave. Set this flat and try and press it as best I can. Um, you can put a line of edge stitching along this top edge, by the way. If you want it to roll over and like stay, uh, or I guess under stitching um, up here. But I'm going to do a little bit of top stitching on this collar later, so I am not currently worried about it for me. Again, many, many options of how to finish these sort of things, but at least we now have a little bit of an idea about how to draft the pattern and put one of these together. Right, so I'm going to set my collar aside for now, and I will go ahead and sew the shoulder seams and side underarm seams of my all in one bodice here. So I can go ahead and line up these. Very easy, straight to <laughs> very easy to sew straight shoulder seams here, like so. Just use a couple of pins to keep that together, and again, same for the shoulder seams. And I'll do the both, uh, the same for both sides. And we will go ahead and sew those together with again half inch seam allowance as always. Over here on the machine, I will go ahead and stitch those. Just stitching around this curve here. Again, this curve I usually throw an extra line of stitching in before I clip it, or I will fully line a garment like this. There's a couple of different ways to finish the underarm little curve here on an all-in-one. I've never, I've only ever had one fall apart on me from having it be clipped, and that was in a delicate silk fabric, and I wore that blouse to death. I don't think I did anything to reinforce it either. I didn't put an extra line of stitching in there. It had one line of stitching in there, and I had clipped that seam, and it was a single layer blouse, and I wore it like probably once or twice a week when I was working retail for like eight hours a day or whatever, or longer. So that one fell apart on me, but it was, I put it through the ringer and also washed it in the washing machine despite it being silk. So the only time I've ever had one of these fall apart on me was because I did abuse it quite uh, harshly. So I think most of the time, if you were not being so hard on your clothes like I was, should be fine. And again, just put a little right here along this curve, just put an extra line of stitching in, come off the machine and come back on, um, put an extra line of stitching there before you clip the seam and that will help reinforce the area um, there are a couple, again, different ways to do that, but that's just usually what I do, and I have never had much trouble with it. 
but I don't uh, put a lot of stress on my clothes normally anymore because, of course, I don't leave the house that much, so things don't get worn too, too often, and therefore keeping them in rotation keeps uh, <laughs> keeps them nice. Here I am just going to go ahead and press open that seam. You saw I just clipped it there, so I forgot to even speak about what I was doing, but I just clipped about every centimeter, every half inch, along the curve of the underarm seam for the all-in-one here. And yeah, that it's, it's open and, uh, like, ability to come unravel is high in here, um, but... I've never had one falter on me too hard. Anyway, I'm going to press open these shoulder seams over here on the end of the ironing board, just because I find that's what is easiest. And again, all of this would be surged, at least, if I were making this as like a real garment to throw in my closet. But now I'm going to find the center back of my neckline here. I could have marked that with chalk earlier, but wasn't thinking ahead. But I can go ahead and match up the center of my collar, and I'm going to sew this one layer of the collar to the center back of the neckline here. Now, of course, we're sewing a straight edge onto a curved edge, so we have to be careful. I am going to use quite a lot of pins today um, to try and avoid getting any puckers along this situation, um, because, again, a very curved edge of this neckline and a rather straight edge of this collar, it's a little bit trickier, which is why you see, don't see me use collar things very often, because I'm like, oh, I'll have to, like, make it work. And you know me, I'm lazy. And any difficulty, I'm like, eh. Again, here at the end of the collar, we'll have a little bit of space. You'll notice the collar isn't long enough to go straight up to the fold. And that's because we have left ourselves a little bit of a like placket in the front or a little bit of extra space for the buttons. And that's why this collar doesn't go all the way to... It goes to the center front, not past the center front, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. But go ahead and pin this all the way along here, including the seam allowance that we had left open. We'd left open this last half inch, right? Um, so I'm going to pin all the way to like the stitching line of the collar basically, which you can luckily see in here because it's black, or see a little bit at least. And I'm going to come back over here on the machine and I, you'll see uh, this angle isn't the best, but I will switch angles, so don't worry. You're like, I can't see the needle at all. I will switch to a different camera angle halfway through this, but I'm going to line myself up and I'm going to keep my other hand here between the collar and the shirt so I can try and again maintain where this uh, is stitching half inch down from this uh, edge at least it will be smooth there and try and get as few puckers as possible just between having pinned it carefully and having my hand in between the layers to smooth everything out as I go. So it's kind of almost the direction here is like less what is happening directly under the needle needs to be smooth. So you, you need your hand in between the two layers, I feel like helps navigate this. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just moving everything along as much as I can just so that the space underneath the needle remains smooth. Everything else can be wrinkled. I just need where the stitches are going to be as smooth as possible to avoid puckering. And so you can't see what's happening with the needle, but I will, again, I'm, this is where I'm thinking, they can't see what's going on. So I will switch camera angles. <laughs> so from this side, you can see what's happening on this side. But again, my hand is in between the layers, keeping everything smooth as I go. And when I get to the other end here, just like I did at the start, I'm just going to stitch right up to where the stitching of the collar is and then backstitch a little bit and come back just so everything is in place. Back here on the ironing board I will remove my pins and then I will end up clipping this neckline because again we have a straight edge and a curved edge together here but I've been trying to get this as smooth as possible on the other side. I ended up with one little pucker over here this time. Dang it! Um, but you know you I wasn't going as slow as I would if I were using like I don't know a nice silk that I really liked. I'd be going real slow. I might even baste it first. What a wild idea. But here I am again clipping about every centimeter if I'm being good here along this neckline, and I'm going to fold all of this into place, which is kind of hard to explain. So right here, I need a clip on my fold over, and then I'm going to need a clip on the other side of my fold over as well so that I can fold this in on itself. So this top little edge that gets left hanging, I fold the seam allowance like so, um, and then I will fold facing up to where it needs to go, and then I will fold the collar under, the seam allowance of the collar under, and I don't know, fold this and judge this until I get it smooth. And then I will pin it into place. Like so. And you can um, stitch in the ditch from the other side to stitch this down. You can hand stitch it down, which is probably going to give you like the most uh, clean finish if you are in here doing it by hand, stitching this folded edge down. You can top stitch this collar to hold this down, which is kind of what you'll see me do. Um, I just put a line of stitching in here. I was like examining some of the collared shirts in my closet to see where they had put stitching on these things. Because again, I'm not working from a instruction book. I'm just kind of making it up as I go along here. Um, uh, kind of imagining my order of operations. 
So I was looking at some of the collared shirts in my closet to see where they had stitching and I was following a uh, Hawaiian shirt that I have in my closet to show me how to do this. So I have to clip here right where the collar meets the shirt like so and I will fold this extension in on itself like that to finish this top edge of the extension like so and that can be slip stitched together or just sewn down or top stitched whatever you end up doing like so and then the facing gets put up inside the collar with the rest of this messy seam allowance and you want this to look smooth because this area it's this side that will show because you know it folds back so mostly this is the part that will show so you want this all to come out quite smoothly so i'm taking my time to position all this the way i want it and fold everything in nicely and smoothly so it looks like this pin that facing out of my way for a while but again i'm just folding this half inch seam allowance for the collar underneath and making sure everything is tucked up inside the collar where it needs to be so that everything inside this neckline edge will be finished. Uh, again, if you had left the kind of like front facing onto this uh, fold back facing, then that would tuck all the way up into the shoulder, um, which is nice if you wanted to face that area. It kind of depends on how sheer your fabric is, what fabric you're using, and other finishes you're choosing to use on something like this. But I'm going to put a very small line of stitching right along this edge here. So I'll take this over to the machine and do that, uh, starting basically where the facing meets the collar is where I'm going to start that stitching, and then I will top stitch the rest of the collar so you'll see what I mean momentarily. All right, here I over on the machine again, right where that facing ends, I'm putting a line of stitching right along the edge of this. I'm just sewing right along the edge, as opposed to stitching in the ditching from the other side, I guess. Right to the other side of the facing, like so. And then I will show you how I like to top stitch collars. Again, this is just a personal choice. You don't have to do anything like this. Um, you can do no top stitching. You can do as much top stitching as you like. You could quilt the collar if you wanted to. You could use one of the fancy stitches if your machine has those fancy stitches. I'm just stitching about a quarter, well, maybe like a little less than a quarter of an inch from the edge. And again, I'm just leaving the needle down and cur curling around so that I can have this like consistent top stitching all the way around. And using the presser foot as a guide here for that. Going all across the back of the collar here. And again, if you, you were using a contrast thread like this on, like, say, a lighter colored fabric, or vice versa, a light thread on a dark fabric, and you could do one line of top stitching, you could do three lines of top stitching. Um, you see that often on 1940s tops. I remember that one of the blouses that Agent Carter wears in that Agent Carter TV show has, like, multiple lines of top stitching on the collar. And again, I could come around this corner, instead of going back down on the collar, I could go around the other corner and then down the front with top stitching if I wanted to. Um, again, with top stitching, you can do whatever you... We can get real creative, and you're basically just free quilting this shirt uh, with whatever design you would like, or whatever accent you would like. But now my collar is on to my bodice. Woohoo! Like so. Now this is what's called a convertible collar because you can pin it, you can have buttons all the way up to the top and this will look like a regular shirt collar. Um, like so, you could have this button all the way up to the neck um, and this would be quite fitted. Uh, so it'd be quite tight, but you know, that's kind of a Victorian prim look to have the collar be quite tight. But then again, it also folds back. So it converts from like a high collar to a fold back collar, um, which is why you have that wide facing on the inside to facilitate that. I am just going to fold my sleeves in a half inch and press them. I'm not going to finish them in any other way for this mock-up, just because I just want to be able to try it on to show you what it would look like, but you could finish that with bias. You could finish it by turning it twice and hemming it. You could finish it with trim. You could finish it with rickrack. You could finish it any way you should desire. Or if you were fully lining this, you could finish it like that. But now we need our buttons and buttonholes down the center front of this, like so. So let's decide how many we want. I'm actually going to give this a try on to see exactly where I want the first buttonhole to be. So I'm going to try this on real fast and decide. I decided about halfway down here, I'm only going to use three buttons on this mock-up. I'm deciding how big I want my buttonholes to be, where I want them to be. Um, unfortunately, the buttonholer that I have, I don't have every size of buttonhole available to me. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So the buttonholes I had to use today were too big for these buttons, and so that affects the finished look of my garment. But of course, most people have a modern machine where you just set the buttonhole to be the perfect length. But uh, you'll see why I can't do that, because I, I don't have a modern machine and I certainly don't have a modern buttonholer. My buttonholer is from 1948, which is even older than my sewing machine is. But I'm just pinning the facing down so it's held in place. Again, you can put interfacing in here as much as you would or wouldn't like, I suppose. It's up to you. Um, but I have this Singer buttonholer attachment for the 99K 
and most singer uh, older singer models and it has these little like uh, dies that you slip into the buttonholer so you have to find the correct size of buttonhole that you want now i did buy the extra four for this because it comes with five i think and then i had the other four but of course this set of extra four had some duplicates as opposed to actually having the four separate ones because buying vintage online hey you gotta double trip triple check that you're getting the right thing anyway so i found a buttonhole that will work for today and it goes in the back of the machine like this um and i can put the rest of these away and i can go ahead and attach this machine to my machine first you need this needle plate cover thing and make sure the needle still can function even with this on so i'm covering up my needle plate with this little cover um, of course you can make your buttonholes any way you like you could have put bound buttonholes in here you can hand stitch your buttonholes so you can use your modern machine to make buttonholes um, but this is a uh, vintage singer buttonholer attachment we're about to see so it gets threaded onto like the presser foot area and there's like a little hook that hooks onto the needle like clamp as well in here and uh you set on the side uh, underneath my thumb here you can kind of see there's an, a lever a lever you can set how wide you want the stitches to be of your buttonhole um, and I have this like size set properly and I'm just lining this up over my indicator mark if you want to make a separate video just how to use this buttonhole or sometime I can um, it seems kind of a niche thing just because not everyone's gonna have one but this is how this thing works so because my machine only does a straight stitch the machine nothing on the machine has changed but this little attachment moves the fabric around uh, as need be in order for this machine to make a buttonhole instead of doing like it's still the machine is still only doing a straight stitch and yet because of this little attachment everything gets moved around perfectly to make it do basically a buttonhole like a zigzag instead and honestly i think this is just magic like whoever designed this little mechanical thing that gets attached onto the machine in order to make this like single function machine do a different function it's just wild to me like my brain does not extend to mechanical engineering i mean in some ways if we can consider making clothes engineering in any sense i can do pattern drafting but this and making this work is on a whole nother level but i just go around uh three times i think i did on this you can make them quite thick if you want to but this makes a lovely buttonhole way better than any modern machine i've ever used in its buttonhole setting this thing it makes a very like a tightly stitched and nice buttonhole and i recently used it on a like finer voile like lightweight cotton and it still worked perfectly fine which i used to have lightweight cotton get eaten by my brother machine so i am in love with this buttonholer i was afraid of it at, st at the start because i mean look at it it looks like some sort of weird little dinosaur that you put on here but it works so well and now i'm gonna be less afraid to make things with buttonholes now again these are too big for my buttons today so i'm not opening up the opening all the way here because um, this buttonhole size is too large for my buttons, but that's all right. Back over here, I'm going to layer that on to the other side here so I can see where I need my buttons. And I did do these three inches apart, so I'm just going to confirm that these are three inches apart here and uh, three quarters of an inch in because that's where my center front is. And I want to sew these along the center front. Again, I am not a button placket or like button opening uh, closure expert here. It's not something I use all the time, so I'm just doing what feels right to me um, and also I did the buttonholes horizontal as opposed to vertical it looks like usually on shirts they are done vertical and then like on dresses and coats and vests they are done horizontal like this I was looking at vintage shirt dress patterns to see which way the, they did the buttons but here is my mock-up being worn with a pair of trousers you can see what the back of the collar looks like behind my neck here and yes that is how much of my hair is actually shaved away but here is my all-in-one sleeve shirt dress bodice again you could do buttons all the way up to the top here if you wanted to and have this button all the way to the top or you can have it folded down like i have here like so like so and you could pop your collar if you want feel a little bit i don't know 50s and fancy um you could have it folded back a little bit kind of like victorian collar and wear it with an ascot or you could just wear it all the way down again many many options even just for styling something like this here's what my collar looks like up close again here's what the back of that looks like like so and uh fold it down here in the front again we can close this if we want that's the beauty of a convertible collar you can have a little button up there at the top if you'd want to and again you can shape the fold back differently you can shape the collar differently you can shape the facing differently you have many options when it comes to design but this is kind of the most basic version 
I hope this video was helpful for those of you who've been wondering how to do the shirt dress, how to do the like button placket kind of situation in the front and add a collar onto the regular bodice pattern. Of course, this could be modified in a multitude of ways. Uh, just check check out uh, you know vintage boards and images on Pinterest perhaps for different ideas for how to like scallop the collar or you know different you make these double breasted down the front really easily if you make the overlap further there's a lot of different style options uh, ways you can experiment with these kinds of details so feel free to color outside the lines as it were and really have fun with your pattern drafting thank you as always for watching this video today and i'll be back here with more vintage fashion sewing and pattern drafting real soon bye